Start my pacer. Woo! <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Pastor Josh. Thank you, Nancy, for your kind words. And um, let me just say how grateful I am to be here tonight. And I've enjoyed the fellowship. It has enriched my life being with you. And this whole business is reciprocal. Amen. Amen. One brother said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and I get all the benefits. I do. And we're blessed by blessing others, and we're, we, we've been blessed. Thank you, pastors, for your kindness, the hospitality. The noodles were great. That's just one of my favorite things, especially the way you folks fixed them. They're real good. Everything was good today. The fellowship has been great. And thank you for smiling. Amen? Tonight, I want to share something that's deep in my heart. And um, I know it's going to be, I, in fact, I'm so excited, I can't hardly wait to hear what I've got to say. <laughs> but um, I want to talk about all things new. You know, we've been, we've been hearing a lot about change and paradigm shifts. Brother Roland just brought us a tremendous word this morning on the vision of the house and where you're going and vision of the fellowship and the new, new innovations and things that are coming into fore. And uh, uh, I appreciated our brother Nate talking about what's going on in Argentina. We've been there in Resistencia and, and uh, our, in Buenos Aires and many other places in the Chaco. Uh, these are familiar places. But God gave us wonderful opportunities. We've, we've ministered now in about 80 different countries and um, everywhere we go, uh, God is doing great things. My good friend Joe Carlington introduced me at a conference not too long ago and he said, you know, Moses walks into the travel agent's office and says, give me a ticket. And they said, well, where to? He says, anywhere. Business is great everywhere. <laughs> it almost seems that way. But uh, God has been blessing us and given us <clears throat> opportunity to see the fulfillment. I just want to bring your focus back to something very critical in my life. And that is, in every new beginning, as I said last night, there is a word. And uh, what sustains me in the gospel tonight, why I'm here, standing here as I was driving out through this beautiful Ohio countryside. I love Ohio. And I, and I even like the people. <laughs> but I thought of the faithfulness of God. When I was just 13 years old, Jesus saved me. A few months later, I was in Toronto, Canada. I was born in Canada. And uh, as I was in this meeting, the Holy Spirit of God, hi, Al, and your dear wife, and all of you that are here from New Hope, praise God, or New Life. <laughs> We're in New Hope, whatever it is. And New Life, anyhow. Uh, I just want to thank God for his faithfulness and that word of the Lord that came to me prophetically. And I didn't know anything about prophecy. I didn't know anything about the laying on of hands and prophecy as much as we do now. But uh, there was a young girl about probably about 17. I don't know how old she was. I was about 13, almost 14. And she began to prophesy in the service. And I didn't see her. She didn't see me that I know of. I didn't. I know she didn't know I was there because I just walked in the door and the power of God just fell on me and I, I was so humbled by his presence that I just fell on my face in the doorway and I just laid there and uh, she was prophesying and while she was prophesying God gave me this incredible vision and it just kept uh, coming to me in full color. It was, a, it was long before television, long before any of that we've ever seen and but it was in beautiful color, and I saw the globe, the whole earth, just turning slowly. And as it was turning, certain nations would light up 
uh, before my eyes, and God would speak, was speaking to me through this prophetic word to this young lady, and she was saying, will you go here? Will you go here? Will you go here? And I was crying with all my heart. I said, yes, Lord, you know I'm willing to go. And uh, all around that whole globe, and, and uh, now after 65 years, I still have a few places to go. <laughs> I've been on seven continents and in many countries, but I'm still longing, I still believe in God, and that's why I'm here tonight, because I'm seeing the fulfillment of God's Word, and the Lord gave us that Word so powerfully, and He's been mindful to watch over His Word to perform it. Amen? Amen? So if God has spoken a word to you, you hold on to that. Yes. Embrace it. Put your arms around it. And hold it tight. The old patriarchs in Hebrews 11 didn't see these things come to pass, but they saw them afar off, and they drew them up close to them. The Bible said they embraced them. Right. And I want you to just do that now, right now. Just embrace the promises of God to you. Draw them right up close. Remember what God spoke to you. Remember the word of the Lord that came to you. Remember God's covenant promise to you, the prophetic word that came into your life. And uh, God may seem slow, but he's never late. Amen. And when you wait on God, you don't lose any time. So I want to honor the Lord tonight because of his faithfulness. He has sustained me. I was flying in a plane, and as I do often, and many hundreds of thousands of miles, and actually millions now. But um, God was so merciful and so gracious always to keep us, no matter where I've traveled. And uh, this one particular night we were flying, uh, I don't remember where I was going, but it was, it was late in the night, and we were just cruising along, and we hit turbulence really bad. Now, I'm a pilot. I've trained as a pilot. And I know what happens in the cockpit when things get kind of wild and hairy. And I know the pilots were struggling to keep the thing going straight. And a young man was sitting by me, and he was really getting frightened. I mean, he was really scared. And he grabbed a hold of my arm, and he said, Hey, you think we're going to make it? And I was kind of smiling, checking on the wing to make sure my angels were still there. And... Uh, <coughs> <coughs> And I said to this young man, of course we're going to make it. And you know, misery likes company. Misery don't like you to be happy. So I was smiling and, and actually kind of tickled, but uh, he, gra he was hanging on tight on my arm. He said, you think we're going to make it? And the plane was really rocking. And uh, I said, of course we're going to make it. He said, well, how can you be so sure? Well, I said, my father owns the airline. And he sent me on a special mission to the same place you're going, and if I get there, you're going to get there. He didn't know what to say. Fortunately, the plane leveled off at that moment, and everything was fine. He didn't have any more to say. But that is the truth. And, and where you're in the will of God, God has a purpose for you, and God watches over his word to perform it. And I said, furthermore, I have several unfulfilled prophecies. Open your Bible, please, to Revelation chapter 21. And tonight, I believe God's going to really uh, do something special in your life, and uh, you're going to be a changed person before you leave here tonight. Now, we've heard some good things. We've heard some exciting things about your future, some challenging words <coughs> from your general directors and superintendents, and I don't know what you call yourself, Roland. President? Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a good title. And uh, <clears throat> uh, I get around so many different denominations and their bishops and general overseers and all of that, superintendents and uh, whatever. But let me tell you, these are good men of God, and we, we want to thank God for them. And hold them up in prayer and Esteem them highly for their office's sake. And uh, thank you, Tom and Nancy, for being so kind to me. God bless you. Revelation chapter 21. Then I saw a new sky, 
<clears throat> a new heaven and a new earth. For the former sky and the former earth has passed away, it's vanished, and there were no longer, it no longer existed, or there were no longer existed any sea. Can you imagine heaven and earth has gone and as we know it, and there's no sea? You know, two-thirds of our world tonight is covered with water. Can you imagine a world without all these oceans and seas and rivers and lakes and, and a whole new vision? And I saw the holy city. I don't know if you get much, as much excited about God's Word as I do, but God's so beautiful and descriptive. He said, I saw the holy city coming down out of heaven and uh, from God, all arrayed like a bride, beautiful and ador or adorned for her husband. Now, this city is described to us as a city that is 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, and 1,500 miles high. It's a cube that's actually coming down from heaven. If you, if you put it on earth, it would go from Florida to Colorado and um, in the cube. If you want to just go to the East Coast and down the way, and you know what I mean, just make a cube out of it. And then it's stacked up 1,500 miles high. Now, that's pretty high. And I'm sure there's got to be some provision for altitude. But uh, God's got that all figured out. And we won't live like we're living now. We won't have to be dependent on oxygen, I'm sure. We're living by the breath of God and, and a brand new body. Amen. Amen. And can you imagine a city with 1,500 miles square? Well, that's what he saw. And he saw this heavenly city coming down to New Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, all arrayed like a bride, beautifully and adorned to her for her husband. Then I heard a mighty voice from the throne, and I perceived its distinct words saying, See, the abode of God is with men, and he will live. He will actually encamp. He will tent among them, and they shall be his people, and God shall personally be with them and be their God. And then God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Can you imagine the size of God's handkerchief? <laughs> Come on. And I, I want you to hear this because this is, most people don't hear much about heaven until, you know, they're like the old boy that was drinking his tea and he never stirred the sugar in his tea and he got it all in the last gulp. And some of you are going to be like that. Come on. A little bit of faith will get you to heaven. But a little more faith will get heaven to you. Come on, Amen? And God wants us to live in heavenly places. He wants us to be acquainted with our inheritance. Amen? And this old boy is just like a lot of us. We'll wake up, whoa, glory to God, we're in heaven. All four of you believe that. Come on. And uh, so anyhow, listen to what he said. God will wipe away all tears. I said, Lord, why would we have tears in heaven? Come on. I mean, I'm in this incredible, beautiful city. I'm in the presence of the eternal God. God himself is standing there. Why would I be weeping? Why would you cry? Listen to me. Look here. Why would you be crying in heaven? I mean, your loved ones are there. Your children are there. Your kinfolks are there. My mother's over there teaching them how to make Hungarian paprikash for the wedding feast. It's, it's I mean, it's, it's going to be wonderful. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah, there'll be some noodles too. But anyhow, why would we be crying? Why the tears? I'll tell you one reason the Lord spoke to me and showed me is because when we arrive there and we discover all the riches 
that were ours in Christ, all the gifts that God had laid up in store for us, all those things that we have never had revealed to us because of our indifference, not because of His will. You see, when we see all that could have been ours, oh my God, all the heartaches and all the distresses we suffered because we didn't know how to tap into the resources of God that He'd already prepared for us. Come on. So just let's get over our tears right now. Let's start asking God to enlarge our vision and increase our concepts. And let us, hey, let us take the book. How many Bibles do we have here? This is supposed to be an open Bible convention. All right, your iPads and iPhones and all that. That's okay. Oh, don't be ashamed. Hold them up. Let's say it together. I believe this is the Word of God. And I believe God will speak to me tonight. Amen. Thank you. Now, when we understand God's Word, here's what he said. <clears throat> God will wipe away, wipe away all tears from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall be in any anguish, no sorrow, nor mourning, nor grief, nor pain any more. Come on. Does anybody want to go there? Yes. Well, in case you didn't know it, we're already positioned there. That's where we live. We are seated with Christ now in heavenly places. Amen. Come on. You say, oh, gee, and the sweet by and by. No, in the nasty now and now. Amen. And we're seated with him. Listen why. Listen to why. All for the old conditions and the former order of things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, See, I make all things new. Now, I'm going to read you a prophecy from the Lord to you. And I'm reading it tonight out of Dr. Eugene Peterson's translation. Listen to what God is saying to you here tonight in the Open Bible Conference in Brookville, Ohio. Here's what God said. This is what God says. The God who builds a road right through the ocean. The God who carves a path through pounding waves. The God who summons horses and chariots and armies. And they lie down and they can't get up. They're snuffed out like so many candles. Incidentally, this is Isaiah chapter 43, verses 16 through 19. Here's what God says. Listen. Forget about what happened. Forget about what happened. Don't keep going over old history. Come on. Are you ready for that? Are you ready tonight to forget those things that are behind you? Are you ready to let go of all your treasured hurts and all the feelings that you've had stored up for so long? Are you ready tonight for a transformation? We're talking about rain. We're talk God said break up the fallow ground. Break up the hardness of your heart. Break up that stubbornness. Break up that old insolence that you have inside of you and, and, and all of those grudges that you've held against God's kids. Come on, we've all done it. Lord, if you knew what I knew about that brother, you wouldn't bless him like that. And God said, I know him and I know you. Now shut your mouth. Just thank God you're here. Amen? Listen, forget about what's happened. Don't keep going over old history. Listen, be alert. Be present. Are you here? I mean, are you really here? 
Some of you folks haven't got here yet. You're, you're still worrying about what you didn't do at home. You didn't lock the door. You didn't put the cat out. And, and you've got all kinds of things going through your mind. And I'm preaching to a parade. Come on, let's be present. Why? I'm about to do something brand new. It's bursting out. Don't you see it? There it is. I'm making a road through your desert. And I'm making rivers in your badlands or your wilderness. God is not going to move you out of your location, but he's going to change the environment in your location. God said, I'm going to put a river in your dry place. I'm going to spring up a river in your desert. And I am going, <laughs> hallelujah, and I am going to give you a highway in your wilderness and with totally complete with GPS. I am going to give you a highway in your wilderness. Listen to what he says. Even the wild animals are going to say, thank you. The coyotes and the buzzards, <laughs> because I provided water in the desert and rivers through the sun-baked earth, <clears throat> drinking water for the people I chose, the people I made especially for myself. I'm talking about a God who can get this done. I mean, he put a rock in the middle of six million people and provided them with three billion gallons of water every day. That's what they estimated these people needed for their selves and their cattle. In the middle of a desert, and this rock was mobile, this rock followed them, and this rock was the rock right here, Christ Jesus the Lord. Hallelujah. He said, I'm fixing to put a, a river in your desert. The people I made especially for myself are people custom made to praise me. Now, if you didn't know it, Eugene Peterson was raised by a Pentecostal on fire for God evangelist mama. And that's where I believe he got his resources. But you can argue all you want about it. I'm not going to argue it. But I want you to know, God is speaking to us tonight. It's time for a turnaround. It's time for a supernatural turnaround that's expected. Now, I've been hearing this all through this conference, that we're moving into a new realm. We're talking about leaving things that are behind, a new paradigm, a new vision, a new uh, concepts, whatever. And uh, I don't think you've seen it yet. Your eye hasn't seen it. Your ear hasn't heard it. Neither has it entered into the heart of man the things, the things which God has already prepared for you. Amen? And that's not a period there, but a comma. But he has revealed them to us by his Spirit. If you want to know, call on me. God said, I'll show you. I'll show you great and mighty things you've never known. I will show you. I will reveal myself to you. I am not a God in secret. Listen, God is not giving you the silent treatment. And every one of you, every one of you are wired for sound. We're not tied to God with anything else but an umbilical cord called voice. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. And we are to be voice activated. Oh, I don't want to get on that, and that'll take us in a whole different direction maybe. But anyhow, I want you to hear what God's saying to us tonight from the Revelation. I am fixing to do everything new. God's not in the patch-up business. The love of Christ constrains us, said Paul, 2 Corinthians 5, 
uh, uh, 14 through 17, or uh, sorry, 17 through 21. He says this, the love of Christ constrains us. We thus judge if Christ died, then we're all dead. However, if any man be in Christ, he's a brand new creation. He's a brand new creation. Let me stop you right here, folks. We are not sinners anymore. Paul never addressed the sinners at Corinth, although there were quite a few of them. Uh, but he addressed the saints. Come on now, let's get it straight. We are not a dichotomy. We are a brand new creation. We are with a new spirit, a new life, a new body. I'm a new person. Amen. When my grandson was transformed a year ago and he's over there preaching now in India, he said, Grandpa, I'm not an, I am not a recovering nothing. I'm a brand new man. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. All things are passed away. Behold, the fresh and the new has come. Everything has become new. Amen? Amen. That's what God calls a real born-again experience. Now, if you don't like the way you're born, try to do it again. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You'll be happy with the second time. God's talking to us tonight about a supernatural turnaround, and a supernatural turnaround begins with a supernatural attitude. Caleb was a man, I'm talking about the Bible, Caleb, now, Numbers 14, 24. The Bible said that Caleb had another spirit or a different attitude. Caleb had a different attitude. You remember that? He was one of 12 spies. Ten of these guys spoiled and poisoned the whole six million people. But Caleb and Joshua retained their confidence and integrity with God. And they saw their vision and they saw the fruit of the land. Amen? Amen. Caleb, my servant, has a different spirit, a different attitude. Your attitude will determine your altitude. Listen to me. Your attitude will determine your altitude. Listen, you are responsible for your depth in God, but God is responsible for your breadth. Now listen, the deeper you go in God, the greater your sphere of influence is going to be. Amen. Now let me say this to you sincerely. God seldom puts a one ulcer man in a three ulcer job. You want to get close to God? You want God's vision? You want God's revelation? Get in there and dig. Come on. The deeper you go in God, the broader your experience is going to be. The larger your sphere of influence is going to be. God will open doors that will astound you. God said, I'll do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you can ask or think or imagine. I will blow your concepts. I'll do exceedingly above all that. And that is what Christ has done in my life. Exceedingly and abundantly, more than I could ever ask or think. And today, I want to tell you that our God is saying to us, Behold, I make all all things new. Right, for these sayings are faithful, they're accurate, they're incorruptible, and they're trustworthy, and they're true, genuinely true. God said, I'm not telling you a fable. I'm telling you that I'm about to make all things new. And I want to start with you. I want to start by resetting you. I want to push the reset button in your life. And I want to push the delete button in your life tonight. And we're going to see both happen tonight before it's over. Hallelujah. I don't have to leave till the morning, so just relax. This is what God says, not what I says. It's what God says, the God who builds a road right through the ocean. He makes a way where there was no way. Amen. <laughs> oh, I tell you, it's awesome. The God who summons the horses and chariots and armies, they lie down and they can't get up. 
They're snuffed out like so many candles. That's all the forces of evil against you. God said, I'll, I'll make them lie down. If your ways please the Lord, I'll make your enemies. I will make your enemies to be at peace with you. Now, if God said, if you get mad at them, I won't. But if you won't, I will. I hope you're getting this. We think we have to fight. No, you don't fight your battle. God said, vengeance is mine. Vengeance is my department. You do your thing and I'll take care of that. Hallelujah. <laughs> when God reverses my circumstances, you know, when God touches you, Mark chapter 8, Jesus is walking along and people came to him and said, Jesus, will you come over here, please, and just put your hands just nicely on this blind man. Just you do it like we tell you, Jesus. Just, just lay your hands on this blind man, will you please, Jesus, and just heal him. Listen, how many hours have we wasted trying to give God an organ recital? Please, Lord, heal him this way. Do this, do that. Cut it out, put it back, undo it, do it, undo it. Whatever needs to be... God don't need our instructions. Come on. This is ridiculous. I mean, he is the creator. Yes. I mean, he made this thing. And Jesus got sick and tired of people trying to tell him how to do it. So he takes this guy by the hand and says, just let's go for a walk. Amen. And he took him out of the town. He just took him out of the environment. Listen, he's a blind man now. He knows his environment. He knows he walks 13 steps to the corner and makes the right turn, and he's going down toward Grandma's house, mm -hmm. okay, or wherever. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. Blind man does that. They have a sensitivity, and I'm not saying this critically. You understand? I have great respect for everybody, so I'm not putting the blind man down. I'm just telling you how it works. Uh, are you with me? Yeah. All right, so Jesus had to take him out of his environment. And he walks him down <laughs> completely out of his environment. There you go. Yeah, that's good. And he brings them out here. Now, Jesus had all, everybody gave Jesus instructions how to heal this guy. So Jesus, <laughs> I'm blind. are you ready? I'm blind. Jesus just, just <sighs> drew up a big old spit and spit right in his eyes. <laughs> now, before at least he made a little mud puddle and he's and he done that and rubbed it on. It, that's a little. He was rubbing his DNA mm. Come on. into this old boy's eyes, and the Bible says <laughs> he just spit in his eyes. Ooh. Now I'm not going to do that to you, but you can. But let me tell you, in the Bible, when you spit in somebody's face, and I think it'd be pretty true today too, it's a pretty deep sign of contempt. Jesus had a contempt not for the man but for his blindness. Yes. A contempt for the spirit of blindness. Oh, and the same Holy Spirit is in this place tonight, and God has a contempt for spiritual blindness. And so he spit in this guy's eyes, and he said, and the guy's whopping the stuff off of his face, holy DNA. <laughs> Amen. And he's whopping the stuff off his face, and he says, son, do you see? And he said, yeah, yeah, Lord, I can see. But wait a minute. What do you see? Mm. He said, well, I'll tell you, Jesus, I, I see men like trees walking. Mm. Well, let me tell you something. Distorted vision is worse than no vision. Mm. You go around shaking hands with trees, and somebody's going to lock you up. <laughs> uh, really? I'm not, I'm serious. How many know this man had distorted vision? Now, was it because Jesus didn't have power? Did Jesus need another charge? Did he need some evangelist to lay hands on him and give him a fresh anointing? No, Jesus is God. And he knew what he was doing. And he challenged this man. He said, what do you see? And I'll tell you why this is real to me. Because Jesus did it to me one day. You see? I was a pastor. I pastored long enough to be pastorized. <laughs> Stay there. And, and I was making a hospital call down Main Street in Finley, Ohio, and I 
I was going to pray for us today. Somebody called me to go pray for me. You know, pastors lived through, I, I was the, I knew everybody in that hospital. I was in that hospital so much, it was pathetic. The doctors knew me, the nurses knew me, and I, I was going down there, and I knew this person that called is a psychosomatic, what's the, be, there are other words for her too, but anyhow, I knew she didn't want to be healed. She just wanted a pastor to come in and hold her hand. I know people like that. They don't want, they don't want to get out of it. They want to be miserable. They want to be sick. I really believe that. Well, anyhow, you're getting very serious with me, and I'm not talking about you now. I'm talking about another person. <laughs> and, I, and, and I thought in my heart, I said, this is ridiculous. I'm driving down Main Street in my city, and I stopped at the stoplight, and when I did, the Holy Spirit spoke to me clearly, and he said, son, what do you see out there? And I saw people, but I saw men like trees walking. They didn't mean anything to me. I didn't feel any compassion for them. And suddenly, it takes 30 seconds about for a light to change approximately. I don't know how long it took, but by the time that light changed from red to green, Jesus touched me the second time. Hallelujah. I tell you, I was so energized. I got, I, I stepped on the gas and I run to the hospital. I went into them wards one after the other. I prayed for the old psychosomatic and, and God bless her, but I'll tell you what, I was going from room to room. I wanted to clean the hospital out because I saw men like Jesus saw them. Come on. Amen. Amen. How many know we need a second touch tonight? Come on. Come on. Thanks, pal. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. That's a bonus. I wasn't planning to go there. But anyhow, listen, God shows up suddenly. God shows up suddenly. We talked about that last night. God is the divine interrupter. He shows up with force. And when he does, he initiates repentance. He initiates conviction. And he initiates revival. We're saying, God, send us rain. What do we mean by that? What you're talking about is not just the rain. You're talking about the results. This is what you're crying for, results. I mean, we don't want just another good old sousing so we can sit here, oh, glory to God. We're so blessed, we're so blessed, we're so blessed. Now, what are we going to do with it? Are we going to go out of here a different person? Are we going out of here with a clear vision? Are we going out here and see men as God sees them? Are we going to see people as Christ sees them? On the street, Jesus Christ of Nazareth was anointed by the Lord God of heaven with the Holy Ghost, and he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For this purpose was the Son of Man manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. He didn't come to cripple him. He came to destroy him. Hallelujah. And that's the same anointing. The same anointing is upon you. He has anointed. I love these signs around here. To recover the sight of the blind. To heal the brokenhearted. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. To preach the gospel to the poor. To preach deliverance to the captives. And to set at liberty them which are bruised. That's the message of this house. Josh, I love it. Don't ever take that down. Keep it ever before you. But when you leave this house, you're going out of here as a full-time agent of the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. God takes a decisive role. He makes the defining moment. Listen, church, we're coming to a tipping point. There's a time when your prayers fill the bowls. There's a time when you cried long enough. There's a time when you prayed enough. There's a time when you've asked enough. There's a time when the God said, okay, I'm going to tip these bowls. You, all those prayers are going to be poured out. Look out, devil. Hallelujah. I'm talking about a tipping point now. Now are you going to see it for your marriage, 
for your business. Come on. For your home. For your children. Don't ever settle back and accept the fact that not all your children are in the ark of safety. You have an obligation to declare salvation for your whole house. Amen. Salvation is a household word. Acts 16, 31 clearly tells us that. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved and your house. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. How about yours? Amen? Don't keep holding on to old history. Listen to God's Word tonight. Don't keep holding on to old history. And I'm talking about brain-dead projects. Come on. God is ready to move you on. This is our supernatural turnaround time. We're going out of here a different people than what came in here tonight. See, I have, I have no other desire, folks. I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, just trying to preach to keep preaching, but I have a mandate from God to bring a message to you that's going to bring perpetual change in your life. I have no greater desire than to see God refire you and restore you to the place where you were once on fire for God. It's time to come back to your first love. It's time to come back to your, to your sincere initial initiation. What did God say to you in the beginning? See, and if that hasn't been fulfilled, God hasn't changed his mind. I want you to know that. I love Romans eleven twenty nine. For the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. Irrevocable. God always gives with the intent of fulfilling it. And he said he's never sorry that he gave you the gift. Think about that. Now, I've been sorry for God more than once. With what he had to work with. Come on. But he's not sorry. He is not sorry. He's already seen the finished product. He knows what it's going to end up like. Amen? Are you ready? Now, God's going to pull you through if you can stand the pull. I see new things on the horizon. So let go of those strongholds. Listen, you let go. Lay aside every weight, every sin that does so easily beset you. Cut that pornography out of your life. Come on. Cut that iniquity out of your life. If you lie, quit lying. If you stole, quit stealing. I'm not talking to heathen. That's in the book of Ephesians, right after the fivefold ministry. Come on, it's in the same book. And he's talking to believers, and God wants you to walk humbly and honestly with him. He's not condemning you for your past, but he's saying quit it. It's time to get it right. It's time to put it aside. Amen? Brain dead projects. Some of you pastors have got some kind of concept of what God wants you to do, and God didn't tell you that in the first place. But somebody put it in your mind. Or, listen, This may sound kind of scary, but some of you are living under a false prophetic pronouncement. And you need to get that taken off of you. I had a sister come up to me years ago in my little church where we were pastoring in Illinois, and she said, oh, pastor, she said, God's called me to preach, and God's called me to sing, and I can't do either one. I said, God's not a fool. Sister, you take care of those two boys you got. That's your calling. And keep them out of my watermelon in the basement while I'm preaching up here. They down there digging the heart out of my watermelon. That's your calling. (laughs) You're not going to get much sympathy from me. But if God has called you, I'll back you all the way. And I'll encourage you. Let me tell you this. Lay aside those 
brain dead projects. Folks, listen. Listen to what I'm saying now carefully. When the horse is dead, dismount. <laughs> Quit beating a dead horse. I love pastors. I love pastoring. I love God's sheep. But I'll tell you, many of my precious brothers and sisters are laboring under false concepts. And they're trying to revive brain-dead projects. There's a time when God said, lay it down. Put it aside. And sure enough, when the horse is dead, get off. We need a turnaround. We need a turnaround attitude. Look forward and not backwards. I suppose all of you have on your right-hand mirror in your car these little words. What do they say? Objects. Blah, 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 blah. Are we together on this? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you all know what I'm talking about. Maybe you can't quote it, but you know it's there, right? Objects that appear in this mirror may appear closer than they really are. Is that right? Is that what it says, something like that? All right, you know what I'm talking about? Okay, so what we have here is a, um, a distorted vision. Because that mirror is not really telling you the truth, is it? So what I'm telling you tonight is this. Your windshield is a whole lot bigger than your rear view mirror. Yes! Come on, come on. Right or come on. Did you hear me? Yes. Now, here's what you've got to understand about the Holy Ghost. Jesus said, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, the Holy Ghost is come, he is going to show you things to come. He not only shows you what you are now, but he's going to show you things to come. Did you know? Is that in your Bible? How many have read that in your Bible? I only need three witnesses. Okay, good. Now, <laughs> when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will show you things to come. Now listen to me carefully. When the devil comes, he always shows you the things behind you. Come on. And when the devil comes to remind you of your past, you remind him of his future. Amen. I'm serious about this. This is very serious because multitudes of God's people are living under condemnation and they don't know how to get it off of their back. There's a brother down here that told me I got on his back last night. That wasn't me really, brother. We'll deal with that later. But I'm going to tell you something. Listen to me. Things are not always like they appear. I lived in Texas for a good while, and Texans are unique people. If you're from Texas, I love you too, so don't, don't misunderstand me. But this little Texas grandmother was in a grocery store, and she went into the grocery store and bought two big sacks of groceries, and she came back out, and she was going to put the groceries in the back seat of her car, and she was going to get in and drive home. Well, when she came out of the store and she headed towards her car, she saw four young guys sitting in the car, two in the back and two in the front. So being a good little Texas grandmother, she reached into her purse and took out her revolver. <laughs> and proceeded towards the car. Well, the four doors opened all at once, and the four boys leaped out of the car, and they were gone. So she put her revolver back in her purse, and then she gently put the groceries in the back seat of the car, and then she proceeded to get in the driver's side, and she pulled out her keys, and she started wanting to start the car. 
Well, she tried the first key and it didn't work. She tried the second key and it didn't work. She, she tried all the keys on her key ring, including the house key, and it didn't work. And then she lifted up her eyes and two cars ahead was her car. So she quietly got out of her car and carried the groceries out and put them in the, her car. And when she got in her car, she turned the key and it worked. So she started the car and then she thought, you know, I, I, I better go report this to the police because I made a terrible mistake. And so she, so she drives around the corner to the police station and she pulled up there, and she went into the police station. There was the four guys standing at the counter reporting. And they said, there she is, the carjacker. <clears throat> Come on now. You know there's a lot of things that are not just exactly like they look. The enemy of grace is the past. Zechariah four and six, we quoted, we Pentecostals quoted. How are we doing for time? Are we okay? All right. You want me to stop now? You don't? Let me see. Only about half of you said that. Are you, do you really want me to go on? Honest? Okay. Zechariah 4, 6, we all quote it. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. I don't want to get into developing that because it's so awesome and so big. I'm afraid we would never come back. But what he said, the spirit of the Lord came upon Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel and said, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. And because of that anointing, he said, you will speak to your mountain. You will say, grace, grace. Are you, are you with me? This is chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. You will say, grace, grace to your mountain, and that mountain will become a plain. In other words, I'll level your mountain. Now, your mountain is going to fill somebody's valley. And your mountain is voice activated. And Jesus said, you say to your mountain, Mark eleven twenty two to 24, you say to your mountain, be thou removed, don't doubt it, and it'll go. Amen? Now listen to me. Your mountain is activated by your voice. I cannot speak to your mountain. You speak to your mountain. Let me tell you why, because most of your mountains are made by your mouth anyhow. But God said, I'm going to make a way. I'll level things. I want to put a river there. You know, David talked about the cup of salvation. Isaiah talked about drawing out of the well of salvation. Jeremiah talked about drawing out of the fountain of salvation. But Jesus talked about rivers coming out of your belly. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Amen. And I want you to know today that God is ready to move you. And any way that God moves you is a promotion. Oh, come on. You don't mean that. Oh, yes, I mean it. I said, if God is moving you, it's a promotion. You ask Joseph someday when you see him. If you don't want to wait that long, check it out in the Bible. And he said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. All of this stuff that happened to me is for your good. I'm a life preserver. I'm here for the glory of God. Now, God's getting ready to move you to a new dimension. God is saying to you today, don't, do not remember. Forget the things that are behind. It's time to release, listen, it's time to release forgiveness, 
bad memories, grudges, baggage of years gone by, weights, and sins. Do not consider the things of old. You cannot keep your mind on old things and expect God to do something new in you. This is a prerequisite for new things to come. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. As soon as we forget the things behind and see our glorious future. And the question is, will you perceive it? Are you going to see it? Do you really want to see it? Do you want to see God do something so powerful in you tonight that when you walk out of here, you're a totally different person? Oh, no, gee, I like what I am. I mean, you know, I've got, I've got a lot of tradition, Brother Moses. Well, tradition is the living faith of dead people. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> and traditionalism is the dead faith of living people. Now, I've really confused you, haven't I? But you think about it. That's what we're talking about. And God's saying, I want, it, I want those things to be put behind you. The future belongs to men of a, of a disciplined mind. God wants to show you great and mighty things that you've never known. And Jesus is coming tonight to this place, and he says, look, I want to do something brand new in you. First, I want to make a way in your wilderness. Some of you are there tonight. God said, I'm going to make a path for you. I'm going to make a way, a highway in your wilderness. It's so encouraging when God makes a way for you Amen. where there was no way. It's so encouraging when God takes your dry desert experience and all of a sudden you have a bubbling up river coming. You've got a new stream of life. That speaks of, of exciting things. Listen, Brother Tom, I was in Germany some time back and I've been back and forth there many times, but while I was in Germany, I was praying, and the Lord gave me a vision. Now, I'm sure it's a vision because it's old guys that dream dreams. <laughs> Keep on visions, brother. Hallelujah. And, uh, I, and he showed me a topographical map. He showed me a top, you know what a topographical map? It was like a big table, and it had a topographical map of old Europe mostly Germany and Austria and the surrounding countries. <clears throat> and in that map, I saw a riverbed. Listen carefully to me. I saw a riverbed. It, there, was, there was a place where a river had been carved out, but there was no water in it. There was no water. There were stones and, and, and old dead bulrushes. It had been a river. You understand? But there was no river there. And I asked the Lord, and I watched because this river went through major cities in Germany. I could name the cities. And the great cathedrals there, like in Cologne and in Frankfurt and other big cities, I saw this river going through, and it would, would go right through the cathedral, the riverbed, the riverbed, okay? It would go right through, and it would come out on the other side. But it was dry. There was nothing there. I've been in those great cathedrals. Maybe eight people there on a Sunday morning, old ladies usually. No, you know, no bad feeling about old ladies because I'm getting up there, you see. I have a great respect for them. But I'm saying this is what happened, okay? Now, as I, as I looked at that map, I said, Lord, what is this? He drew my attention to this riverbed. And he said, this is the river of Reformation. But it has gone dry. And I cried out to God. I said, God, what are you going to do? And here's what he said, Tom. I'm going to rain. I'm going to rain. I'm going to rain. And when I rain, that river's going to be full. And it's going to run right through those cathedrals, and they're going to come alive. And we're going to see cathedrals filled with worshipers. We're going to see cities that are dead and dry as they are in Germany. In many places in Europe, only 2% of the population even bothers going to church. Come on, folks. We're living in an awesomely great country right now. Let's pray for preservation of it because we have some awesome potentials in our country yes, that need to be fulfilled. Amen? Amen. Now God's going to reign. He said, I'm going to fill 
those waste places. I'm going to bring those rivers. I'm going to cause that river of reformation that was never completed. Martin Luther's reformation was never completed. He had two salient points. One was justification by faith, and the second one was the priesthood of every believer. And I'm going to close with that tonight because this is part of the new thing God's going to do in your life tonight. Are you ready? Are you ready for change? Yes. Are you ready to leave here a different person? Yes. Amen. Are you ready for God to recalculate you? Amen. And refocus you and cause your eyes to see as he sees? Amen. Are you ready for that? Jesus said, look, to the church at Laodicea, you say you're rich, you're increased with goods, you've got everything. But he said, I don't see you that way. I see you as miserable, as poor and beggarly, wretched and poor and blind and naked. My God, what a different picture Jesus had of the church than they had of themselves. I'm not quoting from the almanac, brother. I'm quoting from that Bible that you hold in your hand. Amen? These are the words of Jesus who has eyes like a flame of fire. He's the one that walks among the candlesticks. He's the one that says, come on. Come on back to me. He said, I want to restore you. Come on. I counsel you. Buy of me some eye salve. I've got some eye salve for those eyes. Hallelujah. Holy DNA. Hallelujah. I want to increase your vision. I want to give you a fresh vision. I want to give you a fresh revelation. Now listen to me. The one of the things that's going to happen tonight, I'm going to explain it to you. When I speak the Word of God to you tonight, faith is going to come. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the Word of the Lord. Amen? Not my stories, not some clever words, but the Word of God. That's the thing that brings you faith. Amen? We live by the faith of the Son of God that He plants in us. Now tonight, God's going to... I would like for you to, uh, if you wouldn't mind, brother, have somebody move this over here. And uh, tonight we're going to do something that you will never, ever forget. Are you ready for that? It's not going to hurt. It's going to feel awesome. It's going to be good. And brother, I'm going to get off your back. But more than that, I'm going to get something off your back. And God's going to move stuff off of you tonight that you've been dragging around with you that don't belong to you. Now, I'm not going to... I'm not going to make an altar call and say how many people want to get saved because I hope everybody here wants to be saved. I hope everyone here is saved. But we're being saved and we shall be saved. Amen? God wants to continue the work of God in our life. And so tonight, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet, please. And uh, I want to, brethren... Tom and Nancy, come up here and stand with me and help me. And pastors, um, Pastor Josh, I want you to come over here on this side. And uh, yeah, go ahead. You call them, whoever. Pastor Randall. Yes, Pastor Randall. And I don't know all your names, all of you brothers, but you guys know who's who. But what we want to do tonight, <clears throat> listen to me carefully. What we want you to do tonight is to come and present yourself to the Lord and, and these men know that I'm not trying to trick you. I, I'm, they, they, I still believe they have some confidence in me. And uh, I want to help you tonight because of what the Lord did in my life in a very powerful way when he gave me a revelation Amen. from John chapter 20, verses 21 to 23. These are the words of Jesus. <clears throat> Amen. I'm going to tell them to you if you'll come. Good. Come on right up close, because we I take a bath today and I'm pretty presentable. Amen. Good. Good. Come on. We're all family here. This is the Eastern Open Bible family. <clears throat> and miracles are gonna happen. Yeah, if you want to step up, that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. And uh, miracles are going to happen here tonight. If you all just come around, beautiful. That's great. 
Isn't this a wonderful family? Now, tonight we're not taking an offering, so relax. I'm not asking you for your money. But what I'm going to ask you for tonight is simple faith in the words of Jesus that he gave us to exercise. Come on up closer, folks. Come on. Just don't be shy. We look at all the space here. Come on. You can, we can put 14 more people here. Okay. All right. Come on. That's great. Now, isn't this wonderful? Wow. I didn't feel that. Well, this is great. Okay. We're all here tonight. Now, Come on, Mother, we're waiting for you, too. You can come up. If you can't stand, you sit on the front row. Don't, don't stand back there. Just, just get up as close as you can, because we love you, and you're part of this family. Amen. We don't want anybody left out tonight. Isn't Jesus wonderful? Tim, I like you. Amen. Tim means. What does it mean? All right. Now, listen to me. The Lord Jesus came to me in my back study one morning where I was preparing to teach a missions conference. And he revealed to me as I opened the book to John chapter 20, verses 21 to 23. Most of you can quote these verses. I did. I could quote them. But they never, ever really registered with me. They didn't grab me. You know what I mean? You've read the Bible and all of a sudden, something jumps up and grabs you and you say, wow, wow. And that's why the book is so wonderful. It's always got a wow in it. Amen. The more I read it, the bigger it gets and better. Now, the Lord spoke to me what he said to his disciples. <clears throat> what he said. There we go. Thank you, brother. What he said to his disciples, be patient with me and... You remember, he had just come from the grave. Actually, he'd been on the road to Emmaus. But he came back, and he walked through the walls and through the doors and the windows. There was no physical opening in the room. <coughs> Jesus appeared. And when he did, he said, Shalom. Okay, can we say it? Shalom. Okay, that word shalom means freedom from all the agitations and distresses that are caused by sin be upon this place. It's a powerful word. In fact, he'd said at one time, and they were still shaking, and they were still quaking, and they were still afraid. Come on. You know they thought they saw a ghost. And when you see a ghost and the ghost is still there, you still got a little scared. Come on. We're all real, aren't we? And Jesus looked at these brothers in that room, <clears throat> and he said, Shalom, the second time. And when he said that, he said, Even as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Do you remember those words? How many remember those words? I'm not misquoting. Okay. Now, <clears throat> when he said that, then he... <sighs> he just breathed on them. The Ruah of God. The same word is used in Genesis 2 when Jesus and the Father walked in the garden. Hallelujah. The voice or the wind or the breath of God. He breathed on them, didn't he? And then what did he say? The next word, the very next word that he said was, whoever sins you remit, they are remitted. Whoever sins you retain, they are retained. Is that what your Bible says? How many witnesses to that? I'm not misquoting it, okay? Watch those words. Whoever sins you remit, they're remitted. Whoever sins you retain, they're retained. And then the anointing of God came all over me because I didn't know what God was fixing to do with me. And I saw my eyes opened up and I saw something and I said, oh, my God. Now, this is before I read Eugene Peterson's translation of this. I was just reading from my trusty old King James, New King James, and it was powerful. But you know what happened in that instant? Listen to me, folks. I received a phone call at that moment from a friend of mine who told me of another friend of ours that was dying with cancer an hour and a half away. I was in the state of Florida. 
And he said, Moses, this, this old friend of ours, you know him very well, and I did know him. He had one of the largest churches in the state of Florida at one time. And this man I knew had fallen into a lot of sin, a lot of iniquity, and I knew that that he had repented, and I know his wife was still with him, and I know there was some reconciliation there in the family. You understand? I knew all these things. They all came back to my mind and my, as I'm sitting there in this, in this little back porch all by myself and Jesus, okay? And this friend of mine talking to me on the phone said, this brother is dying. He's full of cancer. Both of his kidneys are shut down. His stomach is full of cancer. His lymph nodes are full of cancer. Now, <clears throat> he found out you're in the area, Moses, and he said, he asked me to call you and asked me to tell you that he's coming home to die from the hospital in the morning. They're going to send him home because they can't do, he can't take dialysis. He can't do anything. He's dying. That was his word to me. I thought, oh, my God. And then the Lord spoke to me clearly. He said, son, I gave you this word. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to that man. I want you to take your little anointing oil and just with your thumb, just lay it on him and touch him. And say to him one word, and the word is remission. Or... The Holy Spirit whispered in my ear, and he said, that word means absolution. I said, oh, my God, that's Catholic. <coughs> the Lord said, I know, but he said, you've let them have it. It belongs to you. Wow. You talk about chills and thrills going through my being. I told the man on the phone, I'll be there. When I walked in the room, the man was laying, the sick man was now a bag of bones. He's my size, about, about my age, in fact. And he was laying there on this bed in a fetal position, just a bag of bones. And he raised his bony finger at me, and he said, Moses, you are a prophet of God. Now what is the word? I felt 100,000 volts going through me. I just felt such an anointing. I walked up to him and I said to my dear brother, hallelujah, the word is absolution, remission. Now listen to me. Never had I seen this before, never. But that day, the power of God came on this man and he was totally and miraculously set free. That man was totally delivered, first of all, from the monster that was on his back. You see, watch me now. In Leviticus 16, we have two goats, one goat for the atonement and one for that we call the scapegoat. But the word there in Hebrew is Azazel, and the word Azazel means absolution. It means remission. It means taking it out of sight, never to be seen or remembered anymore. Now, are you folks listening to me? I'm not here to recall your sins. I'm here to get rid of all the garbage that you've been carrying on your back of condemnation and the enemy threatening you with all kinds of insufficiency because of what you used to be. You're no longer that used to be. You are a brand new person in Christ, and somebody needs to speak that word. Now, let me tell you what Dr. Peterson says in his translation, and I'm going to quote it to you, and listen carefully because this is going to grab you. Here's what he said. Whoever sins you remit, they are remitted. Whoever sins you retain, what are you going to do with them? What are you going to do with them? Your brother or sister comes and they've got problems and they've got sins and the Lord said you remit them. And if you don't remit them, if you retain them, what are you going to do with them? We, haven't, we can't do nothing with your sins. It's only the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, that cleanses us. You understand what he's saying? I don't want to take your sins. I can't handle them. But I know somebody that has paid for them. 
and I can speak a word of remission to you in Jesus' name tonight. And from this night on, every one of you will realize that you are born again, kings and priests unto God. When do you think we're going to function as priests? We won't do it in heaven. We don't need it in the New Jerusalem. We need it now. Hallelujah. Millions of God's children are living under the shadow of condemnation and oppression and they are bound by all kinds of restrictions by the devil and they are imposed by themselves. But tonight we have authority in Jesus' name and I want you to put your hand on somebody in front of you because we're going to pray off of you and you might as well receive it. When I speak the word tonight, we're going to see you free from condemnation, free from all the horrible concepts the devil put. Listen, that man, listen to me, that man was totally healed. God gave him two new kidneys. God took cancer out of his body. In a matter of a few days, they called me and said, Moses, you won't believe it, but I, this man is totally healed. And I heard him preach a few months after that. And that man, as far as I know, 10 years ago, is still living. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If I told you who he was, you'd really get excited, but I'm not about to do that because I'm not here to drop names, but I'm going to tell you our God is a God of miracles, and no matter who it is, whether he's great or small, we need to know that we have the power. We are God's holy priesthood. We are God's chosen generation, and we have a function as New Testament priests. We can speak a word of remission to our brother and sister, and they don't have to carry condemnation any longer. God has not given you the spirit of fear or, uh, or intimidation, but the spirit of power and love and a sound mind. Hallelujah. And God wants you free tonight. Hallelujah. It's the blood that sets us free, but it's the word of the prophetic word that comes out of your mouth that sets your brother and sister free. Now pray one for another. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We speak a word of remission to these saints. Absolution in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. All our past, all our sins are forgiven and they're under the blood of the Lamb. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. We're a brand new creature in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Release it now. Release your grudges. Release your bad feelings. Release your... your your, your, uh, all of the offenses that have come into your life, release them now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. <laughs> Whoa! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen, folks. Jesus said these words. He said to the paralytic man, Son, your sins are forgiven you. The old Pharisees, and we got them today, they said, who do you think you are? You, you say you forgive sin. Listen, Jesus said, as the Father sent me, I am sending you with the same authority, with the same commission, with the same ability. Come on, church. Not no limited something. No, we are the sons of God. We are the priests of the Most High God. That's who we are. Come on. You don't have to wear a robe and a collar backwards. You are a born-again child. <laughs> I don't care what your collar does. Let me tell you something. Jesus said to the paralytic man, Son, thy sins are forgiven you. They said, You blaspheme God. Jesus said, Hey, what is e listen now. What is easier for me to say? Thy sins are forgiven you, or take up your bed and walk. Look, it's just the same atonement that saves you or heals you. It's the same by the power of the cross. Amen. That's who we are. Amen. Now, look somebody right in the eyes, right? Turn around. 
Say these words. I see you in the future. Go ahead. All right? And you look a whole lot better than you do now. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Do we sing that little chorus? Brother, do we sing that little chorus? I'm free from the sins. From the guilt. Let's see what it is. I'm free from the up to, up tomorrow. There it is. There it is. Of the past. Okay, let's sing it. One more time. Let's get it right.